thank you for inviting me, Idaho Wheat, and I'm, and I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I was asked to show some slides, so I brought a bunch of slides, you know, for, our, you know, for, for the introduction. And I have a slide here that I have. It's a dual slide, okay? So that should get it going. I'm asked to give a presentation in regards that will hopefully will give you some information about what we look at from the flour industry, the flour milling, and the bakery part. I grew up in the bakeries. Um, Teresa mentioned that I've got you know, some time at, at Cargill, also at General Mills, and at PV, you know, in the Midwest. I have, I'll go into six areas here. Wheat comments, flour from wheat, the variety name. I have some ideas in regards to the variety name. Soft wheat flour performance, hard wheat flour performance, and my harvest conclusions. So hopefully within this, we'll have about 30 slides, and we'll go through this, okay? My first slide, of course, is the wheat itself. We'll have the dark northern spring. I like this because of the color range of it, okay? It's, uh, in regards to that. I, I mean, all, everyone here knows this, but that's, you know, it's a nice little color picture for me. The milling, we have whole wheat, of course, there's the wheat, there's the whole wheat, flour, the brands and the shorts, pretty basic, okay, where we are. Interesting, now that this is up here, we're getting more money, or the industry is getting more money making whole wheat flour. We don't have to separate it. So we get more money for selling whole wheat flour than we do for that. It's less energy, it's easier to pack, it fits in the bag easier. We don't have to separate it. We don't have to sell the brand. We don't have, to, we don't have three or four different products. Okay? When we get in the milling part of it, you understand if you've ever been through a flour mill. I don't have any pictures of a flour mill, but if, you, if you've ever been to there, this will give you a nice presentation. Okay? We always look for the flour percentage from the wheat. What percent flour are we going to get from that wheat? We call that the patent and then the yield. The extraction and the dry dirty yield. I'll have some ash curves, what we call ash curves of Idaho wheat, Idaho and Brundage. We'll have some ash curves of Alturas and some ash curves of some Kansas wheat and, and the Brundage 96. Okay? It'll give you a format of what we're looking at in regards to ash curves and how it mills. These are done on experimental mills. It gives us an idea, should we be involved with this type of wheat for our, our mill itself or another mill. What we have here is a basic slide out of um, a book. It gives us an idea of patent flour, extra patent flour example. 40% of the flour of, this, of a wheat of this flour would be used for cake flour. So what are we going to do with the other parts of the flour? If in fact, because cake flour being white, low ash, it's a low percent of the flour, so what are we going to do with the other part of the flour? So that's something that we've dealt with you know, over the years in regards to that. Patent flour, short patent flour would be a pretty fancy bread flour, something that the McDonald's people would like, you know, strong, white, it can do a lot of different products or high speed products, okay, which I'll get into a little bit later. The long patent flour down here, a high percentage of the flour from it, high ash, kind of brown in color, uh, like a pretzel. A pretzel flour would be high ash. It's, it doesn't have to ferment. There's no specific um, uh, issues in regards to yeast or things of that nature. It's quick, it's easy, and it's cheap. That's what they're looking for. Okay. Definitions. Um, percent of good flour produced from the wheat, that's the flour patent percent. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for a high percent flour. Higher the better, 70%. 72, 75, but 70 is minimum. We really like 70 on a commercial mill. Okay. The product yield would be the measure, the wheat that goes to the mill, what percent, example, 
2.25 bushels, 100 pounds of flour. So it's about 120 pounds of wheat is going to give us 100 pounds of flour. We have 20 more pounds of product that we have to deal with, brand, shorts, feed. Okay? That's what we're looking for. Extraction. Again, same thing, 70%. Dry, dirty yield. We'll remove the water from the mill, from the wheat. Okay? Uh, the incoming wheat moisture, the finished flour moisture is 14. When you buy flour, it's based on 14% moisture. We try and get it about 13.5. It's very difficult, this part, of the, this part of the region, because of the dry in August and the wet in January, February. So our moistures change. Our moistures change from, it can go from 10 to 13.5 moisture on cake flour or cookie flour. That's a big difference. You consider a truckload is 50,000 pounds of flour. Most of the bakeries that I've dealt with in the past, a minimum is 50,000 pounds of flour a day. A lot of them are two to three trucks, 100,000 pounds of flour a day. 100,000 pounds of flour a day, 2% difference in moisture, that's big dollars at 20 bucks a hundred weight. Okay? You're talking big dollars, so it has to be. And so, that's, and so when we're looking at moistures for wheat, we want the moistures of the wheat to be pretty consistent. Because if it comes in at 10 one day and we get another batch that comes in at 12, we have to blend that to 11, temper it to 14 and a half, and usually 15, 15 and a quarter, because when we mill it, the flour has to be 13.5. We lose moisture in the milling process. And it can't be sop, it can't be soaked wheat that goes to the mill because that will clog the mill up. The flour still has to flow. We still have to flow. We have some problems in the past, even in the past, even now, example with California wheat. That'll come in at 8% moisture. You think that's great for a miller. It's not. We can't mill it. It makes a huge problem. It shatters rather than mills. When it shatters, it gets high ash. It gets high ash, the customers don't like it because it's brown. It's brown in color. The McDonald's of the world, so you know, those kinds of people, they don't want to deal with that. They want it consistent in regards to protein, ash, moisture. So we like them, you know, wheat has to be, moisture is a big deal. Okay. These are ash curves. Ash curves are, when we mill flour, example, at, a, at our large mill in Ogden, 60 different streams used to be about 80. We've got it down to 60 different streams. In other words, it's 60 different parts of that wheat is turned into flour before it even gets to flour, and then it's all brought, brought back together again. It's separated out, it's sifted, different sections are sifted, and then it's brought back together at the end. What we're looking for when that wheat hits the first break mill, we're looking at first break flour, 32%. 32%, okay? We're looking at a high percentage right at the very first. If we can, if that wheat hits the mill and we pull off 32% or 35%, we don't have to sift that again. That goes in that bin or sets aside. And then the rest of it's milled, the rest of the flour is milled, and then it's all blended back together again. Saves a lot of money on energy, saves a lot of money all the way down the line. We have first break flours, second break flours, we have mids, middlings, different coarseness as it goes through. Next time you put your hand in flour, hard wheat flour, feel it for all the little pebbles, sand pebbles. We even try and get those out of there. Okay? Density of flour is important. So that's what I'm looking at. When we look at this, we're looking at how well it mills. So we get to the end of it at 80% and we've got 45 ash. That's what we're looking for. We want to be able to get as much as we can out of that wheat and get the flour, the most flour that we can get, easily milled. This is Brundage 96, 210. Their test flour was 
The Brunnage was 29%. That's 3% flour that we don't have to mess with, you know, in the milling process. The bran, we get more bran out of the Brunnage 96. Our break yield, our first break yield, 12% versus 13. Our cumulative ash is the same. Our mids 5 ash, 77 versus 76. Percent, 43. So we got 42 ash at 77% of the flour is 42 ash. Nice clean flour, 42 ash, 0.42 ash. Another one, three types of wheat that we're looking at as a test here, and they're all pretty much except for right here, okay? So we got Alturas, you know, it's 27% on the break flour. We'll have the ash curve, Alturas, 76% is 50 ash versus 78% at 0.45 ash. We'd much rather have 78% of the flour at 45 ash. Much wider, much whiter. We can always make the cookies or crackers darker. We can't make them whiter. Okay. And darker takes more water. More ash takes more water. When we add more ash, we add more water. If we add more water, we have to bake it out. Crackers are low moisture. Cookies are low moisture. We don't want, the more moisture we add in the dough, the more moisture we have to bake out, the more energy we have to use. And the more cleaning we have to do for, for damper, for dampers, okay? for water. Water is important in bakeries. Same with bread. The more water we add to the bread, the more water we have to bake out of it, okay? So that's very important. I did this one here of a Kansas one, okay? Same, sa same type of deal. Even though the, the whole wheat ash is 1.3 and 1.3, we still have 77% at 42 versus a Brundage, 77% at 52. Big difference, huge. Huge difference, right, in regards to this. Okay. We could say Brundage is a nice wheat, but it's a difficult mill for milling. We really have to watch. We have to set the mill up accordingly, and then we can't change. Okay. And we're talking 10,000 hundred weights a day of flour, a million pounds a day. That's, a, you know, that's an average. I mean, that's just, a, that's just starting is a million pounds a day for a flour mill. So that's a big number. That's just an overview of milling, okay, just in, you know, within 15 minutes, huh? This one here, I just want to kind of switch phases with you. I have some ideas. Juliet and everyone mentions about the brand names of the wheat and the names we're giving them, Coda, the various names of this nature. I've, I got thinking about this. Uh, wheat classes, there's over 400 varieties, minimum, in the U.S., okay? Variety names. Okay. Within, for Idaho soft wheats, I don't know how many different variety names there are. Variety names for the brands, here are some of my thoughts. Okay. And the variety names, I got thinking about this. Why not give it a name for its usage? And I'll lead up to this. We have soft, hard, white, hard red, and durum. We'll know that the softs are the winter wheats and they get graded. The white wheats, we have hard white, we have soft white, white club, and western white. We actually still do some western white that gets exported out of Portland. Western white to Japan, western. Does there, do you know what western white wheat is? The blends? It's uh, 10 or 20% of club wheat. Japan sets it every year. Japan sets that grade for western white. It, this year, I think it's 10%. Is it 10, right? 10% of club wheat added to soft wheat ords, and they grade it as Western white. Japan uses that for their cookie crackers. Japan doesn't chlorinate. Japan doesn't another, they don't add a lot of chemicals, things of that nature for their cookies. And their cookie and cake products are different. They don't have the General Mills type cakes there that we have here, you know, those big fluffy cakes. They have sponge cakes and, and this, you know, small, the jelly roll type cakes and the and their soft cookies. Okay. 
So it's a, that's a western white. Then we have hard red, which are springs, um, dark northern, northern, and the Durham flowers. Okay? So that's just a basic slide. I'm sure all you, you know, everyone here knows about this. Okay? Here's what I had about the PNW. At the PNW meetings every year, for the past 20, we score all these wheat varieties. They're milled, they're baked, they're sent out to various companies, and they're baked and they're scored. But the names, Catlo, Alturas, Louise, Stevens, and they even got numbers, Eltan, Bitterroot, okay? So these, I, I, I put this here just for the variety names, soft wheats, okay? And then of course here's their protein moisture ashes, things of that nature, okay? I do their cookie scores, six cookies, we bake them off, set procedure, six cookies, we do the spread of six and the height of six. So now we have a spread height ratio, critical. When you're running on one line, three dozen cookies a second, they have to fit in that package at the end of the day. Right? They have to all fit in that same kind of package. The packages are the same size. Oreo packages are the same size. Those cookies have to be the same. They have to have the same tensile strength. The um, archway cookies, you know, six or 12 in a package, have to be the same size, cellophane. They all have to be the same size. Spread height ratio, critical. The height divided, or the spread divided by the height gives you a number, okay? That number, there's a plus or minus that we have to do in our labs before we send the flour out so the bakeries know. Okay? They're using 50,000 pounds of flour in eight hours to make cookies. They've got to be set, and these are lines. I mean, you're, you know, they're 300 foot lines. And you know, so these cookies coming off the line, 45 minutes later are cooled, they have to be packed. They're not packed, they don't fit that package. I get the call. And we're there, and we're looking at them. And I've made these comments before. I says, hmm, "That's only that's the smallest dumpster you have." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they ain't going anywhere. <laughs> and they're making these cookies in the big cities. They got the farms and the flour mills out here in the small places, and they're making these. And you send these, you know, and the flour goes in rail cars to. Uh, Seattle or Portland or LA or because that's where they're making or Atlanta and that's where they're making these cookies huh? they're not making them in Boise you know so um, it's uh, we have to find a place for those cookies same for tortillas same for bread same for any type of products huh um, I got my Twinkie story that'll scare you too eh? <laughs> the dumpster was too small <laughs> So anyway, this is my names. I'm, so I, I, I'm going for names here. I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to do something here. I'm thinking of market a wheat name to the millers. Example, you're growing the wheat and you're calling it Catlow. Well, that doesn't do a miller any good. He doesn't know what Catlow is. And the merchant that you're selling it to doesn't, you know, they're, they're just, that doesn't mean anything to them either, okay? And then the next step is develop a brand that gets to the manufacturer. Last week, Pepperidge Farm. You all know, right? It's a goldfish, right? Just got the expansion. 60 million pounds of goldfish a year they're going to make. 60 million pounds of goldfish. I'm sure that they would like a name for a wheat that fits for theirs. Okay. I mean, that's just some thoughts, huh? I call it my goldfish tsunami. When we get a mistake there, it's a goldfish tsunami. <laughs> when you're making 60 million pounds a year, that's how many a day? Okay. So, and if anything goes wrong, you don't have a dumpster big enough. <laughs> that's one line, he said one line is 30 million pounds. I mean, they do like 50,000 goldfish a minute. Okay? I mean, they're knocking them out. So, I just, I'm throwing something out here to talk about for this group, you know, I'm in regards to step beyond the milling part of it, and now I'm in the bakery part of it, and, you know, and, and throwing something out for, 
for the growers. Look, <laughs> you don't want to change your name, huh? You're working on that name, aren't you? So, <laughs> example, Brund- I mean, when you think about this, Brundage, it's a, yeah, that's great for a soft cookie. So why can't I have a soft cookie wheat one, soft cookie wheat two? It's just some thoughts, huh? Alturas is great for cookies too. Rotary molded, the dry cookies. Okay? They like that, the dry cookies. It's different than a soft cookie. Totally different. Okay? Catalto for noodles. Eltan, noodles. It's great for noodles. Noodle one, noodle two. I mean, that's where it's going to go. That's, that's your market for a certain type of wheat is for noodles. I mean, and so when the Japanese come through or the Asian customers come through, you know, you have a noodle wheat. That, no, that's the name. Oh, okay. Uh, Stevens, all soft, and Penny Wawa for cracker. Great for cracker. So those are just some thoughts to think about. Eh? An extra deal, deal there. Um, waxy wheats. I put this in just to kind of do a little change up in regards to that for people to think about as you're growing. This is what the milling industry is looking at, all these different kinds of things, huh? We're looking at waxy wheats, increase our softness without adding shortenings and oils. If we can do that to flour, to bread, from flour, that'll save all the way around, save on the trans fats save on the cost of oils, save on the cost of fat, and still keep the bread soft. It may help, especially on the artisan breads, which are low in fat already, you know, one, you know, one to two percent artisan bread that has, you know, like a, a 12 hour fermentation. They're looking for that soft interior hard crust. That may help. Okay? Amylose is black in iodine, in other words, that's how we test it. Korean noodles like El Tan and Alturas, so when you're coming through, I mean, if you think about this as a name, that's what we're looking at. I mean, I know at one time there was, we actually shipped, we meaning Idaho, shipped some Eltan specifically to a customer in Asia, and they liked it. Okay. Uh, partial waxies for increased swelling, pancakes, waffles, batter, corn dogs. Huge, huge line of products for that. Great line of products. Your premix companies would love that. Cake donuts that you eat every day. Okay? Your Dunkin' Donuts, huge on cake donuts. Okay? Um, Alturas, the growers like. Alturas, 68% milling extraction. Growers like it, millers don't. Flat out. We have to figure out what to do, how to get that out of there. And, and, and because it's 68% versus 72, we're losing 4%. We, millers can't lose 4%. I mean, they live on 1% margins, right? With the Penny Wawa at 62, that's even worse. But at least it's consistent. So if we bring it in, we get it, and we know what we have, right? Then we can do something else with that, which is if it's always the same, then we could do something else. We get that 62% here for your cookie cracker, and that extra 8% over here, we can put that off for your pretzel. Even though we're losing money on it, we're not losing it. It's, pays more than feed. Right? So we're getting something else out of it. Okay. Here's what I mentioned on the flour squeeze. And you, I, when you go home and you squeeze, seriously, it's, it's something that I show the bakeries. Take cake flour, go buy a box of cake flour, you know, two bucks, take it home, along with your, your all-purpose flour that you, that's in the store in the bag. You squeeze that cake flour, then you squeeze an all-purpose flour, and then there's bagel flour or pizza flour, which is high protein, you squeeze that. Okay? They're all the same moisture, but the density of the flour is different. The particle size is different. So that makes cake flour bind up. It feels like it's sticky. A lot of young bakers, that they'll complain when we ship them flour, and they'll go there and they say, well, the, the cake flour is sticky. It has more moisture. It's, it doesn't flow as well. It hangs up in the sifters. It's, you know, it's, and it gets little balls in the sifter. Says, That's because of the particle size of cake flour. It's finer. It's like powdered sugar. It's still the same moisture as granular sugar, but it's powdered sugar. And so when you squeeze it, it binds up. Versus pastry flour, 
is a little bit more coarser. Remember I showed you the, or the earlier slide about the percentage of patent flour. Okay? So we have a little bit more ash in pastry flour. It makes it a little coarser. When you squeeze pastry flour or regular cookie flour from a bakery, and you can go in the bakery and do that. I'm sure the neighborhood bakery will let you go do it and squeeze the cake flour, pastry flour, and then the bread flour. And even the bagel flour, ask me if he's got a high protein flour. When you squeeze that, you'll feel the little balls or the little sand pebbles in it. Because the wheat's so hard, it's hard to mill all that to fineness. And you don't want it that way. Because you still want some coarseness in there for fermentation. Because bagels are ferment. They ferment a long time. You know, after you make them, they'll ferment at least six hours. Some, some go 12, some go 24. So that's something to look about. Soft flour performance. The first thing I do when I go to the bakery, I squeeze the flour to see what makes sure it's cake flour or pastry flour so I have a feel. You know, in any bakery you go into, to make sure they, they aren't, they, it's, not, it's the same flour. It's not a different flour that I'm gonna be working with. Bleach, here's something where you can go home, and I, I think I got a couple more pictures about this. Cake flour with bleach flour, and I got cookie with bleach flour also. Two ways to bleach, chlorine gas at the flour mill, or benzoyl peroxide powder, the same powder that they put in Oxy-10, or you know, for your face. It's a powder, it's about seven grams per hundred weight of powder. Seven grams get puts on 100 pounds of flour and it'll turn that 100 pounds of flour a little whiter over a 24-hour period. Oxidizes it, turns it a little whiter. Okay. For chlorine gas, we, put, we add the chlorine gas at the flour mill, usually about an ounce and a half of gas per 100 weight of flour. As soon as it's sprayed on, it changes the pH of the flour, and it turns it white. There's no residual effect. There's nothing on it. The only way you can tell if it's chlorine gas or if it is by taking a pH. So when your mom, way back when, bought flour and she says that flour doesn't work to make bread very well, she probably bought all-purpose flour that had chlorine gas on it. Or that flour worked great to make tortillas, but I can't make bread out of it. It probably had chlorine gas, a little bit of bleach, keep it white, and then it has a different effect on it because it denatures the flour. But when we put benzoyl peroxide on it, the label still says bleached, but it doesn't do anything to the flour. It doesn't have any performance whatsoever effect on the flour. So she's still buying bleached flour, but she bought ble bleached flour chlorinated versus bleached flour benzoyl peroxide powder. They both say bleached, and they both react differently. In the military, they used to have all-purpose flour, and that all-purpose flour could be used for cake, or bread, or a cookie, and that's chlorinated. That was, you know, back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Nowadays, they just put powder on it, and it doesn't make a cake, which I'll show you later. I talked about the drying. Okay? The drying of the wheat's critical, and we wanted to try and be the same all the time. Okay. So when I talked about this, for the texture of the flour, remember I showed you the one about the texture of the flour, this just goes over that again. It just says that the different flour difference has different particle size in the milling process, which gives it a different texture in the flour itself. Okay? Still the same moisture. Okay? The soft wheat is just a finer particle size than hard wheat. And it's, when you squeeze it together, it'll hold together. Okay? Hard wheat, more free-flowing. It seems like it has less moisture, but it, in fact, does not. And the spring wheat, of course, I just want to say that again, you can squeeze it as hard as you want, and it won't hold together. That flour, and it's still 13 moisture. Okay? I talked about ingredients in regards to bleach. I'll just give you another thought regards what we look for on ingredients for flour. When you buy your bread, you have two types of enrichments, a reduced iron or a ferrous sulfate. 
makes a difference. Reduced iron, sometimes you'll see, uh, you'll see some hamburger buns or bread with little teeny pin black spots on the top, and the size of a pin. That's because they're using reduced iron. The reduced iron, the iron particles haven't dissolved yet. They've changed the process, something's happened within that process, and there'll be little black spots. We had it on some bagel products years ago. A customer bought a bagel company, and they were taking ferrous sulfate, which does not have iron on it, and the new owner says, my label says reduced iron, so we had to put reduced iron on it, and he made his bagels with reduced iron. He had black spots everywhere, everywhere. I mean, they looked like they had measles. It was up, it was everywhere, it was just terrible. We go in there and say, well, that's, that's what's going on. So when you look at your label now, when you buy your bread, some products have ferrous sulfate, some products have reduced iron. It depends on the process, it depends on the product, okay? but it's something that, you know, that we're aware of, and I just want to bring that to your aware also. I talked about the bleach, benzoyl peroxide powder versus chlorine gas. Very important in regards to how your product's going to perform. Critical. BZ powder has no effect on baking. Chlorine gas has a major effect. Major effect. That's why some flour mills can't make cookie flour. They can't chlorinate. Some flour mills can't make cake flour. They can't chlorinate. If you can't chlorinate, you can't make cake flour for the General Millses and the Pillsburys and the Duncan Hines of the world. Okay. This is what you're looking at. pH 60, which has no chlorine at all. Natural flour. Okay. Flat. Spread height ratio, I didn't put spread height ratio on here. It's probably nine. Ten is flat. In other words, it's, it's uh, ten, 10 centimeters by 100 centimeters, so it's flat, okay? So that's probably a nine. pH 5.6, just a little bit of chlorine. Just a little bit of chlorine, you're not changing it much, okay? But look at the difference. Oh, that's a, yeah, matter of fact, that is a 10. And that's a 7.2, see, six cookies. Remember, these cookies have to fit in that package. And we're looking at one line is three dozen a second minimum. One, one line and cookie plants have three or four lines. I mean, 50,000 pounds of flour in eight hours. Right? It's a lot of cookies. They have to fit that package. And it doesn't happen until they cool. 4.6 is what cake flour is. That's cake flour, 4.6 pH. You know, an ounce and a half of chlorine. And it's a 6.26 spread high ratio. There's the difference right there. Big difference. That's why you get some bakeries, some flour mills, that can take your wheat or not take your wheat, or like your wheat or don't like your wheat. It depends on their product line. And it depends on what they have and what they're making. Right? Cakes, 4.6, nothing. Looks good in the oven. When you're baking that cake, it looks real good. It comes up in the oven, comes real nice, looks real good, they pull it out. Three minutes later, it's flatter and flat. What the heck happened? Right? I get a lot of calls, I used to get a lot of calls that uh, they want uh, natural cake flour. We want natural cake flour. Well, that's natural, 6-0. That's treated. <laughs> I say, okay, I'll send you some natural cake flour. And we'd send it to them, and they'd make their cake, and they'd say, well, it's not what I want. I said, well, that's what you got. <laughs> okay? did some work years ago in regards to natural cake flour with rice flour and wheat flour and a blend of flour, sorghum flour, and various others. There is, you know, that it'd be like a stir and frost cake or a, a, um, a snack cake. That's what you would do. Okay? Um, there is some work being done now to make cake flour without chlorine to equal this. But that's going to be a process change. And that's, there's some, you can do it now, but it costs a lot of money. Right? So that's, that's the coming industry for cake flour. I have a few slides on hard wheat here. Okay? That's your soft wheat. I have a few slides now on hard wheat. Malt variation is critical to what we're doing in the baking industry. Malt on the flour. So we want, need the flour 300 minimum, falling number. 
and then we'll add the malt to equal the process and or the product, okay? I'll have some, um, some pictures of um, pup loaves, small loaves, controlled test, okay? I have some barley malt comments and why, why I like, or the industry likes, strong flour. We can always make flour weak. It's difficult to make it strong. Malt flour. 62 falling number, 250 falling number, 400 falling number. Too much malt. You're all aware of falling number, yes? Falling number is we add, um, we're checking the enzymes, which, which we'll go through a little bit later. I didn't want, you know, okay. It's something that you have to ask your extension office <laughs> and, and Idaho wheat and follow up on falling number. That's what we look at in, in the wheat, what the falling number of the wheat is, and of course the flour. Okay. This process is a straight dough. From dough from the oven is 90 minutes, straight dough, like a Subway. Subway, they take it out frozen, they proof it, and they bake it, and you're done, right? And the Subways all have to be the same size to be your Subway sandwich, right? That's a Subway, 90-minute process, quick process. This other process would be the Sara Lee, a Wonder Bread, or anybody else, a large bakery that has a four hour process. So in other words, they take some of the flour, they mix it with the water, they let it set four hours, it ferments, and then they take that back, that sponge part, they, with some yeast, they take that back, they add it to the mixer, then they add more flour, water, sugar, salt, flavor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and make their dough. Okay. This is the difference in that, in regards to that, and again, with bread as, it, as with cookies, it has to fit the package. So when you go in your store and you look along that bread aisle, that's the first thing I do to make sure that all those breads fit that package. They're the same size. So when they pick them up by the plastic, they fit just right. They aren't sagged. They aren't brought over. And you'll see that. Now that I mention this to you, you'll see some breads that are kind of sagged at the top. It can be overproof, which can be a malt issue. It can be underproofed, okay? but that could be a malt or strength issue. Okay? Barley malt is the amylase, alpha amylase. They steep the barley in water. They dry it and grind it. I put down about three ounces per hundred weight. That's, per, that's a lot. We add two to three ounces per hundred weight of flour within the process to achieve that falling number. But the process is the flour is milled, there's nothing on it, it's in a bin, brought out from the bin by screw conveyor, going to the truck or a holding tank, 50,000 pounds gonna get in a truck. In the transfer, the screw conveyor set for the enrichment, the bleach, the malt, various ingredients, then it gets in a bin, the bin has to go to the truck. Once it's in the truck, a sample's pulled. That's where the sample's tested. So if our falling number is off, we have a truckload of flour. That's not correct. We have to take it out and do it again. And that's a long, that's a two and a half hour process. So a truck's tied up for two and a half, you know what it's like being a, a truck that's tied up for two and a half hours. So we have to know the falling number of the flour in our bin to be able to set the malt feeder to get a 250 falling number or a 260 or 270 or 280, whatever that number is gonna be for that customer, okay? Critical, critical. If my falling number is off, I'll get, if I don't have enough malt, it won't turn the yeast over, slow fermentation, I'm set for 600 buns a minute, one line, 57 minutes proof, eight minutes bake. If I'm off three minutes, I'm messed up. Bread, bread is about 200. We have new lines now that they've built in Nevada that's 400 loaves a minute, 400 loaves. If I'm off two minutes, I'm in big trouble. Fermentation, it's critical. Bread production is 180 to 200 loaves a minute. 
pretty standard. Pretty standard in a, in, you know, in a bakery nowadays. Bun production, 400 to 600 units a minute. Pretty standard. One line. One line. I don't know too many bakeries that are one line. There's one currently that's working in Southern California that's 30 trucks a week. Five trucks a day. 250,000 pounds making one product. 250,000 pounds of flour making one product a day. That's a lot of buns. Okay? Fermentation, 57, 59. You got to be right on. Bake time, right on. Dough times, mix times, 9 to 12 minutes. I can't be off on my mix times either. Flour's got to be there. Malt's got to be there. That's why I said earlier about the scab and the falling number. It's critical. It's critical. Bake times are constant. You know, a minute here, you don't, you don't have a minute to play with. You do not. Hey, you, okay? Strong flour. Here's the strong flour comment. Very much in favor of strong flour. I can always weaken my flour by malt. If I want to make a bun with it, I can weaken it up. Instead of a 250, I can have a 220. Okay? If the operation isn't set for, even for bagels. Bagels are real tough, strong dough. The dough is harder than this table. Okay? It's tough. It's hard. Okay? Um, but it needs the malt in it to ferment. And that's why bagels, when you cut them open, they're nice and hard inside. Hard crust inside the, you know, the interior's solid. Okay? So I can change the malt. So I can change the malt number okay, to get a little softer so I can reduce the mix time, make it softer, and still be a tough product. Remember, if I have to mix 16 minutes versus 12 minutes per dough at 2,000 pound doughs per hour, I'm losing 8,000 pounds, I mean 800 pounds. Okay. Can't do that. Lines won't take that. Okay. The last slide is for ascorbic acid. It does something for flour. What we're looking at are buns here. These are Kaiser rolls that I've done. And 50 parts, legal limit in the US is 200 parts per million of ascorbic acid. It's not so much the USP vitamin that you're in, but it's ascorbic acid that we're using at bakery. So you'll see that on your labels, on some of your bread products. Okay? If the flour is a little weak, we'll add ascorbic acid to increase the strength and to make the interior much more finer. If you've been to Cuba or Latin America, they use a lot of ascorbic acid. And the dough is, or the bread is very, it's like cake flour inside. I mean, like a cake inside. It's just, it's very clean, very smooth. A lot of ascorbic acid is used for it, okay? And we use that here in the US also for certain products. Okay? We, I don't know any products that are over 100 parts per million of ascorbic acid. I don't know any in the US. Usually they're in the 50 parts, and then the bakeries will add a little bit on their side. It comes in tablets. Okay? So hopefully this gives you a little, uh, just a little touch within 30 minutes of what we're doing in the flour, or in the flour milling and the bakery part looking at, your, at the wheat products. Okay? And there's John Deere, and then there's Joan Deere. Okay. <laughs> that should be it. Thanks very much.